So please give a warm welcome to Rob Farrow, who is going to speak to us about research methods in open education and share insights from the Global OER Graduate Network. Welcome, Rob. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to this session. Uh, good to be with you today. Um, so my name's Rob and uh, as Marion said, I'm uh, a researcher with the Open Education Research Hub at the Open University in the UK. And um, one of our projects is the Global OER Graduate Network. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is really about some of the outputs and activity that we've had uh, in GoGN, as we call it. So just a brief overview of the kind of terrain that I'm intending to cover. Um, first of all, just a bit about GoGN, in case you're not familiar with it. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the Research Methods Handbook as an idea and kind of where it came from, then how we put it together, some thoughts on um, how we decided to try and present material to um, the network members. Um, and then I'm going to say a bit about the kind of you know, insights that we generated. Uh, I can't give you all of them necessarily because there's quite a lot and they're quite detailed, but um, I'll indicate what's in the actual handbook and how it's intended to be used. Uh, and then I've also got some thoughts to share about um, how we could uh, improve the handbook in future editions and treat it as a kind of ongoing um, sort of living document that uh, is, is uh, iterated each year. So, first of all, go GN. Um, so uh, if you're not familiar with GoGN, um, the network was first started in around 2013 um, with Fred Mulder as the uh, main lead. And um, since uh, I think 2018, it's been administered by uh, the team that I work with at the Open University. It's funded by the Hewlett Foundation. And um, the aim really is to provide uh, a community of practice and a network of support for uh, people who are pursuing doctoral research in open education. So the aims of the network are to raise the profile of this kind of research, uh, to offer support to the people who are doing it, but also um, to come to a better understanding and promotion of openness as a practice and as a kind of function of research. Um, so um, the network has grown quite substantially in the last few years. We now have more than 100 researchers. Um, and then there's a wider uh, community around that of experts, people who supervise PhDs, people who do mentoring, and also people who are just kind of advocates for open education and OER uh, who um, want to be connected to and offer support in, in that way. Uh, so why have we got a research methods handbook in the first place? Uh, I think if you start off with just the idea of a research method, um, there's a kind of, there's a sort of deceptive simplicity uh, to what we do when we do research. Um, and we try to create new knowledge or find something um, new out about open education. Um, and when we talk about methods, we talk about essentially the techniques that people use when they do research, how they collect data, how they analyze it, how they share those findings with people. Um, and it can be done in the, in the format of testing a hypothesis, um, but not necessarily. But generally speaking, the idea is always that through the actions that you take, you support some subsequent net claim to knowledge that you've um, get, gained through those activities, even if you've just proved a null hypothesis or something like that and so said, well, we know that this doesn't work. You found some sort of new knowledge. So why do I say it's deceptively simple? Um, well. Uh, if you will, it's just the sort of tip of the iceberg, um, because once you start to interrogate um, the idea of knowledge creation and the idea of you know, taking certain actions to produce new knowledge, you end up kind of going deeper and deeper into the kind of philosophical assumptions that underlie those claims to knowledge. Um, and it's quite possible that you know, most researchers will not necessarily engage with this sort of level of theory um, certainly not before they get to a, a doctoral uh, level of research. Um, and it can be quite difficult to sort of navigate this territory. And one thing that we found um, when uh, we were getting feedback from our members was that methodology and research method is an area that 
consistently people were concerned about and were looking for additional guidance. Um, the way that GoGN works, um, everyone who's um, a doctoral member already has a PhD a research supervisor or supervision team, depending on where they're based. Um, and we kind of uh, offer support alongside that. Um, and sometimes what happens is the people who are supervising a PhD in open education or OERs or MOOCs or anything like that don't necessarily know much about that specific area. Um, so sometimes people come to us because they want support specifically on working um, either on the subject of open education or they were interested in pursuing a sort of open educational approach or open educational practice with regards to their research. But even if you're not doing um, open education as part of your research, method is, is kind of hard, right? And it, it, you can quickly feel like um, you get lost trying to justify what you're doing. Even aside from that, um, people who are very well versed in these kind of things can experience imposter syndrome. Uh, or feel like they don't understand other methods outside their own. Um, and generally speaking, we found that people were more comfortable expressing these kind of concerns to us in smaller groups or one-on-one -on -one rather than in a big group where we often kind of discuss things in, in a sort of open way. Um, and I think related to um, the fact that not everyone can access expert supervision in open education, um, the fact that it's a kind of emergent field of study and often involves taking methods that have been developed in other contexts and then applying them to um, the, the field of open education. It's not always an entirely comfortable process. Um, and in addition, those kind of open practices around how we collect data, how we analyze and share it, all can be seen to be in tension with some traditional assumptions about how research works. Um, and uh, in addition, I think different disciplinary backgrounds, because openness tends to bring people from all kinds of different fields together. Um, there's also a kind of um, mismatch between some different disciplinary backgrounds and different academic cultures. So we were very much led by um, sort of demand from our members in terms of coming up with this approach. And the goal of the handbook because we knew that we could never explain every research method um, in adequate detail. And in a way, we weren't trying to. Um, but we could try to contextualize some of this stuff within an open, open education um, context and to talk about uh, how some of the feelings and experiences that people have around this kind of stuff are perfectly OK and also quite common. Um, and so part of the way that we approached that was to collect experiences from our own researchers about, about their PhD research and the kind of methods they've used, what worked well, what didn't work so well, and what kind of insights they would like to share with uh, up and coming people who are interested in doing research in this area. So the approach is very much kind of reflective and, and critical. Um, but we were also trying to um, keep things accessible and offer a kind of uh, easier route into um, method than some of the kind of foreboding text that you can uh, catch out there that um, are very technical and very uh, make a lot of assumptions about how well people understand the difference between different research paradigms or epistemologies and that kind of thing. Um, so we wanted to explore some of the philosophical foundations, but not necessarily go, you know, uh, writing chapters and chapters about um, ontology and metaphysics and that kind of thing. Um, but more to sort of allude to these things and sort of explain that this is where the differences come from. Uh, so we had this idea, we had this concept. Um, we wanted to partly draw on our own expertise um, as OER Hub, uh, but also to draw on the expertise of the wider membership. Um, not least because everyone works on different uh, things and we different approaches and you know we don't claim to know everything about research methods we were quite interested in drawing on the whole network um, as much as we could so um, back in January we first put an announcement out about this project and uh, we had uh, so we had a webinar in February where we had a kind of open consultation we had some input into what kind of things people wanted to see in this handbook um, we also had um, a survey that ran from January to March where we asked people about 
research methods that they used in their own work and what they found worked well and what didn't and so on. In April, we were due to have um, a face-to-face -face workshop, which was to coincide with OER 20. Um, in the end, for obvious reasons, that couldn't take place. We ended, it ended up being sort of reduced in scope a little bit to a webinar rather than a sort of half-day workshop. But we still had, by that point, you know, some uh, sort of outline structures and some kind of ideas about where it was going. So we got some more feedback then. And um, spent kind of May and June drafting and editing. We had uh, a sort of op an open Google Doc, so anyone who was, uh, who'd contributed could, was free to um, come in and just, you know, do some critique, offer some suggestions for things we could improve and hopefully um, improve the quality of the manuscript. And then we published in July. So the report's out there and I'll, I'll, sh I'll share a link um, at the end. Um, it's all CC by, so you can access it. But I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the presentation style in, in more detail. Um, so this is, so last year, uh, um, we uh, went through a kind of rebranding of our visual identity as GoGN. And as part of that, we, um, we met with uh, Brian Mathers from Visual Thinkery. And this is his mind map of the discussion that we had about the kind of things that we were trying to convey with the, the, the GoGN concept. Um, and um, we're very keen to emphasize kind of empowering people, the idea of um, supporting people's academic journeys, uh, supporting social justice, supporting people who, whose voices are often more marginalized in research and that kind of thing. Um, and um, where we ended up was with this idea of a kind of um, golden age of travel or a kind of go travel guide. And um, this identity um, has been sort of running throughout our recent work with our, you know, kind of tickets to travel to webinars and our, our annual seminar and that kind of thing. Um, and this was also integrated into the, the style of the, um, the methods handbook. Um, I can see there's some penguin chat already um, emerging. In, uh, so penguins are the unofficial, semi-official mascot for the GoGN network. Uh, partly because they're from the global south, partly because it was a bit of a coincidence with some penguins. It's a long story, but um, uh, they're very popular with our members. We we have our own penguins that we send out to people. Um, and so the, the journey of the penguin became the kind of idea behind the sort of visual design of the report. So um, with this iceberg and the, uh, uh, the penguin starting off with methods, not necessarily realizing how much there is sort of under the surface. Um, so keeping with that idea of travel, um, the early part of the report, uh, or handbook, I should say, details um, the uh, philosophical foundations of different methods, so ontology, epistemology, and, and axiology, or the study of values. Um, and these were uh, seen, as, these are presented as kind of like things that you have to know, you have to kind of just get your stamp and, and get on with it. Um, but it's, it's your starting point, and it gives you a, a foundation and a place to work from. Um, and gradually we, we work through sort of more and more complex um, paradigmatic comparisons and philosophical um, foundations for different approaches. Um, this is a diagram which shows you a kind of spectrum of different, um, I suppose, metaphysical commitments in a way, um, whether you think that when we do research, we're uncovering something real and true whether you think, as if from a more constructivist perspective, um, that all, all, all knowledge is relative, for instance. So there's a kind of spectrum between those things presented here. And at the bottom, you can see different methods which are characteristically associated with these different positions. So it's, it's complex stuff, right? And having some penguins lessens the blow a little bit. Um, but it's also interesting seeing um, uh, how people come to these kind of things with different assumptions and different kind of um, perspectives themselves. So there is no sort of view from nowhere, if you like, with research method. Um, but I think um, trying to map the terrain out and show, well, this is the kind of spectrum of possibility um, is quite a useful exercise. Um, and 
certainly the kind of thing that um, uh, most people would benefit from um, as researchers. We also did some um, redrawing of um, existing uh, resources. So for instance, this is about um, the research design process and the content is actually taken from um, a university course which is no longer being presented, um, E891. And here it's redrawn as a kind of map for you to find your way. But it kind of takes you from the idea of I've got a question I'm trying to answer through the kind of philosophical um, elements, through the research paradigm and into a sort of design process. So what kind of things can you do to find data around that? Um, in terms of the, um, the structure of the book itself, um, so we have some discussion around the philosophical foundations. We've also got some stuff around research paradigms in there. And then we, we talk about paradigmatic methods. So um, what kind of methods are associated with different approaches kind of classically, um, but also how do these kind of map onto open education research? Um, where does it become um, pertinent to think about these kind of things with, with a particular question and that kind of thing? Um, so similarly, here you have, um, this is again, this is a redrawing of someone else's diagram, but with some changes. Um, but you can see here the penguins are kind of taking you through that process, starting with a sense of values or a sense of um, what your um, commitments are as a person, as a researcher and so on, through your, um, your sense of what there is, the ontology, you, well, how, how you can find out about it, epistemology, how you can actually do some research, which would be your methodology and your method, um, and where you get your data from. So um, trying to um, summarize how these things work as a whole, as concisely and accessibly as possible, um, but also throughout we kind of give quite a lot of um, links to other resources and to other interpretations of how to present this stuff. Um, so there's another part in the um, handbook which is primarily written by the OER Hub team. So some stuff around open research. What does an open research cycle look like? What do open practices and research look like? And so a lot of that bit draws on Martin Weller's book, um, Digital, Digital Scholar. Um, but, um, but also um, we looked at the process of how do you go about designing a research project, not just in terms of the research design, but some of the stuff that people don't necessarily think about, like planning it out, thinking about the ethical issues, thinking about risk, thinking about what technologies you might need to use, I suppose what you might need to learn to be able to use them, um, and kind of self-management and self-care as well, um, which are not kind of things that you would typically find in a guide to research methods. So um, if you like, that's the sort of first half of the handbook. Um, the second half is where we present the insights of the uh, GoGN researchers themselves. And I did think about putting some examples out for this, but um, there's just too much content and too much stuff to actually uh, go through. And there's a lot of detail there. So it's probably better if you're interested to go and have a look yourself. But these are the kind of things that we cover. So action research, doing case studies, doing content or thematic analysis, uh, design-based research and interventions, discourse analysis, ethnography, evaluation, experimental research, grounded theory, doing interviews and focus groups, uh, doing a literature review, um, mixed methods research, uh, narrative research, doing observations, doing a phenomenographic work or phenomenological work, social network analysis and uh, surveys and questionnaires. And for each of these sections, we have a description of the uh, PhD project that someone is working on, and then also how they used a particular method in their research, what they found worked about it or didn't work about it, and any advice that they would have for anyone following them um, if they want to use that method, um, which is, again, not the kind of thing that you would normally get in this kind of um, research methods guide. Um, and we take to be a kind of open practice, this kind of sharing of you know, um, things that people don't necessarily normally share in a traditional kind of scholarship. Um, 
So one thing um, I said at the start, one thing we were interested in is the idea of the emergence of characteristic practices in open education research. And I'm not sure that we quite got uh, to the, an answer to, to all our questions around it. Um, certainly not to the point where uh, I would feel sort of like um, insisting that everyone was doing these things. Um, but some of the things that we came to associate with people working openly were these kind of more agile ways of working, um, often a more kind of intimate connection between what they were doing and the kind of practice that they were trying to change uh, or influence, I should perhaps say. Um, this the idea of transparency in sort of how how people work how they get and share their data um, is definitely associated with open practice uh, as is this uh, idea of an enha enhanced social media presence and uh, online presence um, and uh, leveraging the network itself and using personal networks as a way of uh, collecting data um, is another kind of characteristic activity um, I think sharing data, sharing tools, developing research instruments in collaboration, uh, publishing results through open access, and um, I think also a kind of explicit interest in working towards social justice or having some sort of ethical component to what they do. These are sort of, I would say, emergent. Um, maybe, you know, you could develop this a bit more into a kind of um, sort of template for how people do this kind of work, but in a way, part of the whole approach is that um, openness empowers people to do the right, you know, things for their own kind of context and their own uh, needs. Um, on social justice, actually, I mean, um, when we uh, talked about uh, axiology as a kind of fundamental element of research method, um, that's not necessarily something that everyone would include, um, but uh, it does foreground the idea that people's ethics and values are a core part of how research happens and you know, why you choose to look at one question rather than another, why you choose one, one method rather than another. Um, again, it kind of challenges the kind of uh, uh, received view of research as something very analytical and dry and, and um, cognitive rather than physical and embodied. So um, off the back of this, uh, some of this stuff around um, open practices, we also include in the book, in the handbook, some prompts to try and encourage people to think more, uh, reflect more about their uh, the assumptions of, and their kind of goals in what they do. Um, and that's supposed to be, I guess, partly about personal practice, but also about how to refine your method in the right way. Um, so thinking more about what are you actually trying to do with this research? Are you trying to just uh, identify a pattern? You know, are you trying to challenge a narrative or um, support some sort of professional practice and so on? Um, but then also thinking about what difference is open making in your research? Um, and that goes back to some of the things that I was uh, just going through. Influencing practice, do, making things for other people to use, sharing your stuff as widely as possible and so on. So, um, The uh, handbook has been live for um, almost two months now. Um, I think we've had something like 4,000 downloads, which I thought was pretty good. Um, and also I think reflects uh, a desire by not just PhD researchers, but for a wider community to be interested in um, having this kind of support and, and, and this kind of guidance. Uh, so on the GoGM website, you can download the um, report in its entirety. It's licensed CC BY. Uh, we also have a download for the images, so the images are also CC BY and you feel free to play with them and put penguins around everywhere. So um, one idea we had around this handbook, um, so the original conception was that this handbook would be um, part of a series. So the next one we have planned is to focus on theoretical perspectives specifically. So um, Sometimes the, the, the boundary between a method and a theoretical perspective can be quite blurred because, because of the assumptions that a particular theory makes might inform a method. Um, so sometimes people said, well, I'm working in this way, but we kind of said, well, that's more a theoretical perspective than a method as such. So we have another volume planned, which will be um, focused much more on theories and how to use theories, how to understand them and so on. But for this um, resource, 
we're also thinking that we could do a different edition of this in the future as more of our researchers come through and finish their doctorates um, they can contribute something to the handbook about their own experience and so on um, we also think there's some stuff missing um, in you know there's certainly things that are used by people outside our network open textbook research uh, adoption studies uh, coop framework stuff like you know so we're thinking about trying to maybe commission some more people some more people to write about the methods that they use maybe outside the network um, as I said, we want to kind of keep developing this, this sense of what open research is and how we can understand it. Um, but also, I think we, um, we could add more detail around research design. And um, it adds a lot of complexity, potentially, uh, to give kind of detailed guidance and all the kind of possibilities. But that seems to be where people also need some more support. So not just um, understanding methods and how they work, but also for my project, how can I make this better? How can I plan this better? Um, if you're interested in penguins, there's um, a paper based on the kind of visual aspects of this handbook uh, forthcoming in a special issue of the International Journal of Management and Applied Research. I think it's coming out this year. Uh, and one last thing I wanted to draw to your attention is we just had, had another publication come out uh, yesterday. Um, and in this one, it's our research review, which again is going to be a regular series every six months. Um, we're going to get our members to review uh, recent research in open education and um, give us their kind of critical reflections. So um, that just came out yesterday. Um, again, it's CC BY. Uh, you can access it on the GoGM website. And what I would just like to do uh, to finish is just to say thank you and acknowledge the contributions of all of our members who uh, contributed copy for the report and, and uh, were involved in the editorial process. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you, so thank you very much. Um, I won't read everyone's name out because there's so many. Of them. Um, it's definitely a, a group effort. Thank you. Um, if you could all put your hands together for a really amazing presentation. Um, we've just got a few more questions before we break for lunch, uh, a few more minutes rather for some questions, and I'm sure, Rob, there'll be many. Um, but thank you very much for making sure the summit is overrun by penguins. So I think both on Twitter and in the chat, um, that was the dominant contribution. So that's been amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So um, we can use... The mic, um, give you the mic if you raise your hand if you want to ask Rob a question in person or please post any questions you have in the chat and we will pick them up from there. We'll give you a few minutes um, in case there's any particular points. I'm just going to scroll through the um, chat as well to see if there's any particular questions that came up earlier. Rob, um, I'm going to jump in with one question, um, as everybody seems to be busy typing still. Um, but you were just mentioning kind of the, the next step and um, what a really positive um, response you've had so far from the publication. Um, is there anything in particular you feel um, you want to hone in on for the next part? Um, one thing I think would be um, good to have more of is uh, an overview of um, well-established um, methods from uh, a sort of North American context. So a lot of the a lot of the um, work that's been done around um, textbooks, as I said, and uh, Coop framework stuff, where there's this very big library of papers now doing very similar sorts of research. I think it would be really good to have that captured in what we're doing, um, and I think. In a way, you know, there are still many more methods that we could look at and include. Um, I think, in a way, the key thing is hitting the balance right, where you don't really want to be writing an encyclopedia. Um, you want to be kind of producing something that people can still find accessible. So, um, so yeah, I think it would be really good to keep adding to it. Um, I think, in a, in a way, the, the real benefit is over, over time, um, as it gets improved each year, 
I think it could really, um, really be quite unique, actually. We have quite a lot of positive comments, but also a question. Um, so Lucy has posted that in the chat, um, I believe on behalf of Maddie. Um, how did you use the mind map to inform your research? So the mind map was really about um, the GoGN brand, if I can put it that way, our visual identity. So we had various ideas about what we were trying to, to convey with it. Um, so it was only really indirectly that it influenced the, the handbook in the sense that the visual identity came first. And it was a little bit ironic um, that we had this whole uh, sort of travel motif, partly based around our annual uh, seminar where we bring members together and um, normally uh, coincide with either Open Education Global or the OER conference. And obviously that hasn't really been happening this year. So um, a lot of our ideas about um, the travel motif, they, it ended up being quite abstract because people are still at home. Um, but that idea of the journey and the sort of the support, the excitement of going on this journey, maybe it's almost, uh, almost a little bit intimidating as well. All those things kind of came together into um, the kind of visual style and the, uh, the kind of uh, orientation, I suppose, for the reader um, in trying to understand this stuff. So, so yeah, not exactly the research, but more the kind of presentation. Thanks very much. Um really interesting as you say it's a specifically challenging time to be a global network at a time when when people can't travel um so i think we are um at our full time now and it's two o'clock um but i'd like you all before you head off for lunch um to just put your hands together one more time and give a big penguiny thank you to rob who's presented so wonderfully here at the alt summer summit and um it's been a pleasure rob and also lorna thank you so much for leading an open education session that's inspired us all. Um, we have a one hour break now with live sessions and we'll be coming back at 3 p.m. when the Alt Summer Summit welcomes Angela Staney for a very special Q&A where we'll particularly have been focusing on racism and academia. So I hope many of you will take the opportunity and join us for Angela's session then. Thank you very much Rob and Lorna. <laughs>